Good evening. Welcome to this, our midweek Lenten devotion coming to you from Trinity Lutheran Church here in Frankfurt, Germany. I'm Pastor Gary Schuske, and it's my privilege to be with you here this evening for our time of devotion. Before we begin, I do want to remind you of kind of a long-standing tradition here at Trinity Lutheran in Frankfurt. In days gone by, we've gathered here in the sanctuary for our devotion time, but before that, we gathered for a light soup supper and a bit of fellowship. Uh, we're not doing that this year, uh, but we are asking you to consider doing that from your home on Wednesdays as sort of a way of doing that together. And one more time, I'll tell you, if you have a good soup recipe, why not send that to the office? We'd love to see that. So with that thought in mind, let's take just a moment or two in silence preparing for our devotion. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for today, and also the theme uh, for our devotions this year, comes from Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And that's our theme again tonight. Uh, the theme that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Our gospel reading continues where we left off last week. Now it's the end of Luke chapter 22 and the beginning of chapter 23. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things, blaspheming against him. When the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away into their council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it for ourselves from his own lips. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. So far, the reading of our gospel and the text for our devotion for this evening. So a question for all of us this evening, have you ever said words like these? Are you ready? My mind is made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. I hope none of us have ever actually said those words. Maybe we have somewhere along the way. But the truth is we all think that way, at least a little bit from time to time. Every one of us has areas in our lives where we sort of made up our mind how things are supposed to be, and maybe we're just not interested anymore in having more information, having more facts. It wouldn't be a bad thing, by the way, for all of us these next few days, maybe to spend some time thinking about that, looking more closely at our lives, looking closely at our hearts, where are those areas in our lives where we've just pretty much made up our mind? We don't really want to have any more facts. And as you think about those things, I hope that'll also prompt you to be in prayer. Those are, are good things for your life, good things for other people as well. But tonight in our gospel, that's exactly what we have. We have people who have made up their mind and they don't want to have any more facts. Oh, but it gets worse than that. They've made up their mind about what the fate of Jesus Christ should be, and still they want no more facts. Now, we've traveled with Jesus for a while, haven't we? We started in the upper room, and of course, we're going to go back there on Monday, Thursday. We went from there to a garden, and then to a courtyard with Peter and the rooster, and now today we finally go in the council chamber where the council, the Sanhedrin, meets. You'll find this account also in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's, or Matthew's Gospel and in Mark's Gospel. And I'd encourage you to please look at those sometime this week to maybe round out that picture a little bit. But tonight specifically, we're going to talk about the things that are very unique to Luke, some things he wants to show us. 
One thing he wants to show us for sure is we have people tonight who've made up their mind. Don't bother them with the facts. I hope you notice at the very beginning of the gospel, those that have got Jesus in custody, they are beating him and they are mocking him. And by the way, he's had no trial. He hasn't stood before any kind of a judge or any kind of a court. They are doing this of their own accord. We're told they mock him. They beat him. They put a blindfold on him and they strike him and then say, prophesy, who struck you? Think about this for a moment. What are their actions saying? They've already decided that Jesus is guilty. They've already decided that Jesus should be condemned. We go from there now into the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish council, you might say. And I want you to stop and think about this for just a moment. These are highly respected people, highly honored people in that society. They, they are learned. They have a great deal of wisdom. They're, they're looked to for leadership and for example. But Luke tells us something else about them that night. When Jesus comes in their presence, Luke tells us they were of one mind. They were of one voice. They were of one thought together. He actually says this four times in these short verses. What are they certain about? They are certain that Jesus should be put to death. And all they want to do is catch him in some words that they can give to Pontius Pilate, hoping that'll be the end of the whole matter. Now keep your eyes on Jesus, because Jesus is there, the innocent lamb, but he also is not going to help them. One person in the Sanhedrin says to him, Are you the Christ? Tell us. And Jesus says, If I tell you, you wouldn't believe. And if I ask you, you wouldn't answer. Then Jesus speaks next. And he says, Now you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power of God. That prompts one of the people in the Sanhedrin to respond back to him, Are you the Son of God? And listen closely to what Jesus says. He says, you have said so. They take it as a conclusion. What other testimony do we need? We've heard it come from his own lips. Dear friends, before we go any further, let's think about that for a moment. What did they hear from Jesus' lips? First of all, they really did try to put words in his mouth, didn't they? Actually, they also wanted to accuse him of blasphemy, but don't forget there's a real fact here to consider. Jesus really is the Son of God, so there is no blasphemy here. Still, for them, it's enough. One more time, they're all together, and they go to take him before Pontius Pilate with the goal of having him put to death. Let's talk about that for a moment. How do you feel about all of this? How do you feel about the way that Jewish council stood before Jesus? How do you feel about their motives for their actions? It should make us sad. It should make us angry. But there's one other possible response, and this one we need to be careful about. Sometimes we can look at a scene like this and we can say, how could they have done such a thing? I would never do something like that. I would never be that arrogant. I would never be that arrogant. I would never be that kind of a thought in my mind. I would always be standing there for Jesus. My friends, can you hear the pride in that? Can you hear the ignorance? Can you hear the arrogance? One of the most dangerous things we can ever do in our Christian lives is to compare ourselves to other people especially imagining for a moment that they're somehow not as good as us, or maybe a little bit less than we are. Because as soon as we think that way about someone else, it's kind of hard for us to serve them, isn't it? As soon as we imagine that someone is a little bit less than us, it's awfully hard to have compassion or to share their burdens. As soon as we think someone is less than us, it's even possible that maybe we're not as concerned even as sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, please remember, 
The response to the actions of the Sanhedrin and of the crowd that day is not, I would never do that, but rather, but by the grace of God, there go I. My friends, we have wonderful hope in this passage. Why? Because there really is one person who is better, one person who is the best, one person is perfect. His name is Jesus Christ. The book of Philippians says it so well, though. It says that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, being obedient, obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place, the name that is above all names. That's what Jesus does. He travels into Jerusalem. Remember, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He traveled all the way to the cross, and on the cross he spoke familiar words to those that had mocked him and beat him, to those who had given him a phony trial, those who were seeking his death, <clears throat> and to you and me in the brokenness of our lives also. What does he say to us? He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. On the cross, Jesus died, and the tomb, the Father brought him back to life again. Jesus is alive, and sure enough, where is he right now? He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and the Spirit is there as well, and they're busy having a conversation. Do you ever stop to think about who they're talking about? And the answer is you and me. Jesus looks at us and he tells his father, it is finished. I paid the price for them. They are mine. They are forgiven. They will live forever. Think about maybe tonight when you have trouble sleeping or sometime in your week when you're rather stressed out about something to know that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are having a talk and they're having a talk about you right now. Now, we, of course, can find Jesus other places as well, can't we? We find him in the Word, whenever we read or hear a message or study that Word. We find him in the water of our baptism. We find him in the very body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. But he also makes us a promise. He literally dwells in our hearts. Whatever is going on in our world right now, whatever is going on in your life or mine, Jesus makes us the promise that we are never, ever alone. The truth is, my friends, Jesus has made up his mind about you. He says, you are mine. That is a fact. And that is a forever fact. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? We pray today for the church all around the world, that many more people might come to faith in Jesus Christ. Be with our congregation and all congregations as we seek to share the good news of our good God with the world and with our community, as well as we seek to serve those around us. Help us to look out for each other as well. We pray for our world, for all governments, all leaders, all people. We might work together for the good of all. We especially remember again this evening the people of the Ukraine. And we do so now in a time of silent prayer. Pray for each one of us. Thank you, Father, that you've created and sustained us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you came, took on human flesh, and gave your life that we might live. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for calling us and keeping us in faith in your Son. Continue to work in our lives as we seek to serve others, but also help us be merciful to those who serve us. For all people in need in any way, we pray for the sick, for the suffering, the grieving, the lonely, and the isolated. 
we now take a few moments to raise before you the prayers of our own hearts and minds. In this season of Lent, Lord, draw us closer to you. Keep us ever to look forward to that day when we will see you face to face. For all these things, whatever else you know that we need, we offer before you in our prayers, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray Martin Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We join together now in singing the words of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heaven. Host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We have our time of sending. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Have a blessed evening.